Welcome back to Kentucky Route Zero. I've been waiting about two years to be able to say that, because that's when I last played it. About two years ago, I finished Act 4. The fifth act, which is what we're going to be playing now, is the final one. It took them a bit longer to come out with Act 5 than even they anticipated, but here it finally is, and from what little I've heard about it, it's supposed to be really, really good. Which isn't surprising, because this game in general is really, really good. However, being two years, I myself had forgotten most of what happened previously. I'm going to run with the assumption that you too watched the series back then, and you don't remember exactly what happened either. What I'm going to do is read a summary that I've written for each act that we've already finished, and in between the acts I'm going to play the interludes. Uh, yeah, there's an interlude between each act, and I don't think I played them in my original playthrough of the game. I'm not quite sure. I'm pretty sure I haven't. And I think that will be a nice little breather in between reading the act summaries, and should also help jog our memory, I think. So, Act 1. Conway and their dog stop at a gas station. That's Equus Oil. Conway delivers things, and they ask the gas station owner for directions to 5 Dogwood Drive, where their current delivery needs to go. They're told to take the Zero to get there, and to find Weaver Marquez for directions to get to the Zero. Weaver tries to help us, but the TV, which is a portal to the Zero, is broken. They end up sending us to Elkhorn Mine to find Weaver's cousin, Shannon, who can fix things, so they can fix the TV. An accident happens in the mine that hurts Conway's leg. Later, the TV ends up being fixed, and we use it to enter the Zero. End of Act 1. So let's play the interlude now. Um, this menu might be a little bit confusing at first, it was to me until I started clicking around and realized how cool it is. It's set up in a very occult kind of way, this looks almost like a summoning circle. And this hairpin in the center, I love that it's a hairpin, such a mundane object, is being used as a pointer. And the way it kind of scratches around when you click on something makes it look like it's, it's being controlled by some otherworldly force. Uh, and yeah, and these are just all the acts. That's Act 1, it has a cross through it because we've already finished it. And then that's the interlude, Act 2, already finished, interlude, and so on. So, limits and demonstrations, the interlude between Act 1 and 2. Love the way the view spins around. Limits and Demonstrations Alula Chamberlain Retrospective uh, We haven't gotten to talking about Lula Chamberlain yet, but I think we'll start to mention them in Act 2. Remember they worked at the Bureau of Reclaimed Spaces, I think was the name. They were the person trying to help us get the files to figure out where 5 Dogwood Drive would be. Marking the first major public showcase of her work in over 20 years, this retrospective exhibition of work by pioneering installation artist Lula Chamberlain comprises a diagonal slice through time, place, and form. The pieces on display here are individually debuted over a period of 35 years, designed in Chamberlain's various homes and studios between her beloved Mexico City and her native Elizabethtown. They represent a range of scale and impact from the intimate warmth of vertex texture fetch to the infamous visage, the latter of which requires a vertical clearance of over 30 feet. Yet these works share a confounding legacy. In each of their debut exhibitions, they were nearly impossible to install I just want to stop for a second and say how cool this sounds. Vertex Texture Fetch. That sounds so cool. And apparently it's intimate. Galleries and museums balked at the scale, power requirements, and highly skilled labor involved in maintaining these works for display. 
Some of their debuts collapsed under the weight of logistics, only to be successfully executed much later. And so, just as they describe the outer limits of Chamberlain's range as an installation artist, the geographical edges and vertices of her itinerant home life and the beginning and end of her distinguished career, the works on display here also trace the extremes of our capabilities and the frontiers of our patience as both viewers and exhibitors. Are we capable of viewing these works as they were meant to be viewed? Do we even want to be? Let's go clockwise. That's so cool. Oh, it gets louder as you walk closer to the pedestal. Title card, Spinning Coin Suspended, Correcting for Angular Motion, 1976, Found Materials. Apparently we're playing as Emily, and one of the things we can say is to Ben. That jogged my memory a little bit, and I looked at the summary for the first act. One of the things I didn't mention is remember when we went into the basement of Equus Oils trying to turn on the generator, I think? And we saw three people at a table playing cards, and none of them could see us. It's like we were completely invisible to them. Or they were in a different universe to us. Well, those three people were Emily, Ben, and Bob. So that's who these three are, I think. Or at least two of them. Mm. To Ben, didn't you have one of these? Oh, yeah. I did have an old microfilm reader like this. I got it at a garage sale. Couldn't figure out what to do with it. That's my whole shed. Just a bunch of weird obsolete electronics I thought I might use. Someday. Yeah, maybe. Or maybe I'll just sell them for scrap when the price of lead and plastic goes up. I guess everything gets broken down eventually. Vertex Texture Fetch, Tree Television, and Suspended Cathode Ray Tube, 1968, Found Materials. The picture on the TV. What is that? It's a lighthouse? No, it's a weather vane, or a windmill, or something. Is it a lighthouse? Visage, 1984, Unknown Media. What is that made of? It's a mystery. Looks like... ribbon? Bandages? Oh, have you seen the Invisible Man? It's... Slice a visage to build a visage. A puzzle to its owner. What? It's a poem I read. I think it was written by a computer. I think it's lovely. I feel like those long computer printouts or receipts or something kind of stuck in a vortex. There's a shape that they're making as well. It does look vaguely human. And these 
These up here kind of look like a f horns, perhaps? These kind of look like ears. Overdubbed Nam June Pike installation in the style of Edward Packer. 1965, 1973, 1980. Magnetic tape, handheld tape playback head, speaker system, voice of the artist, computer synthesized speech. Oh, I read about this one. It's interactive. How does it work? It's a bunch of old tape, and you run this tape playback head along it and just listen to the recordings, I guess. Oh, so this is all just tape laid out onto a board. Let's try it out. I think you start in the middle. As Bob drags the playback head along the tape, a woman's voice issues unsteadily from the speakers. I love that the text itself is all scratchy. We start in the middle. Donald and Joseph are in the hallway. I'm in an office. The walls are lined with filing cabinets. A few drawers hang open. The door is ajar. A massive computer looms in the corner. There are some punched cards on the floor. A synthetic voice recording, spliced awkwardly into the tape, lists out options in monotone. To examine cards, rotate 30 degrees and advance 7 inches. To leave room, rotate 17 degrees and advance 4 inches. To activate computer, rotate 200 degrees and advance 15 inches. Eh, examine cards. Bob moves the playback head to another strip of tape. Encoded in the holes punched through these cards is a first draft of the Poetics subsystem. I can't read punched cards by sight. Donald can, I think. Anyway, this version was pretty underwhelming. To leave room, rotate 17 degrees and advance 4 inches. To activate computer, rotate 200 degrees and advance 15 inches. Leave room. I'm standing in a hallway. The walls are a blank beige. It's just after winter quarter, but before spring, so there are no students around. Usually these walls would be papered with flyers announcing new student clubs, looking for roommates, selling old textbooks, but now they're blank. Seems like it skips around a bit. Donald is here, scribbling on a scrap of graph paper. Joseph is here. He can hear me talking into this tape recorder. Distant. You sound like an anthropologist, Lula. Donald Distant. An antipologist? An entomologist! <laughs> to lean on Joseph's shoulder, rotate 70 degrees and advance 11 inches. To take Donald's hand, rotate 270 degrees and advance 2 inches. Lean on Joseph's shoulder. This is the beginning of the tape. I'm at home, alone. Joseph just left. We had an argument, but it'll work out. Wow, this is kind of personal. I feel a little embarrassed. I know what you mean, but she put it out there. I usually start here in my home, whenever I'm sketching out a new piece. I start by just looking around. My closet door is open, and I can see a few sweaters and a dress I like. To go downstairs, rotate 11 degrees and advance 4 inches. To think about dresses, rotate 150 degrees and advance 15 inches. Think about dresses. It's kind of a terrible dress, actually. Denim. The breast is embroidered on one side with a crude sketch of a tall man in working clothes, but one of his legs is obscured by the lapel. 
I guess I just like the cut and the color. I could fall asleep sitting on the bed here, holding this tape recorder and this glass of wine. It's a good thing I'm not holding a cigarette. I think I'll go for a hike tomorrow. Maybe Donald would like to. To fall asleep, rotate 70 degrees left and advance 9 inches. To think about hiking, rotate 115 degrees and advance 7 inches. Think about hiking. We're on a dirt trail in the park. Or, well, it's not really a trail. Donald in the distance. It's a trail. It's more like a tendency. There tend to be fewer plants here on the path we've been walking. Why does that sound so familiar to me? It's not a trail, it's more like a tendency. I'm feeling like a vague sense of deja vu at that. Like I've heard it somewhere before, maybe from this game itself? I don't know. Walking sounds. Now we're walking at the edge of a massive hole. The dirt gives way to mossy rock as the ground sinks into darkness. Joseph and Donald are following a rope down into the cave. They have computer equipment tied to their backs. So do I. Wait a second. This is something that happens later. A massive hole? Joseph and Donald taking a rope down into the cave with computer equipment tied to their backs? Remember, all the way in, I think it's Act 3, Three, we end up in the Hall of the Mountain King, and we play on the Xanadu computer a text adventure game, and I think it's within the text adventure game that we end up going into the giant hole with the computer equipment and doing something. Huh. To enter the cave, rotate 65 degrees left and advance 4 inches. Ben, that's the only choice. Yeah, that's the end of that one. So, 65 degrees, 4 inches. That's the last trip. So everything's down here now. Distant. Donald in the distance. The final resting place. Joseph in the distance. Don't be so morbid. To remember a fond gesture, rotate 180 degrees and advance 23 inches. To regret a harsh word, rotate 12 degrees and advance 6 inches. Remember. It's morning now. I'm in the car. I'm driving to work. This is the last recording I'll make on this tape. And then I'll drop it in the mail tomorrow. And then, who knows. I've been recording on this tape for... 15 years, I think? A lot of other things happened. So, here's a story. When I met Donald and Joseph, they were both students and I was in a band performing on campus. They came to my show and then we met at some bar and had a few drinks together. Joseph wanted to impress me, so he stole a metal cocktail tumbler and gave it to me. We got kicked out, wandered drunkenly until morning, and finally ended up at a diner. Now I use the tumbler to store extra pens on my desk. So, I'm almost out of tape. I guess I'll... I'll just let it run out while I drive. No instructions? No, that's the end of this tape strip. I don't think we ever reached this long one at the top here. Is it cheating to skip over there? Hmm. Maybe we missed something. Can we skip back a bit? That's the last trip. Everything's down here now. Okay, instead of remembering a fond gesture, let's regret a harsh word. It's late morning now. I'm sitting at my desk on my lunch break. This is the last recording I'll make on this tape, and then I'll drop it in the mail tomorrow, and then who knows. 
been recording onto this tape for 15 years, I think. A lot of other things happened. So, here's a story. The first time I moved to Mexico, I stayed there for three years, and I had no contact with either Joseph or Donald in that whole time. They each thought I'd done it to spite them. Maybe I had, in part, but I don't think they ever appreciated the community I had in Mexico. Or... Anyway, when I came back, I didn't call them or visit the university. I ran into Donald completely by chance at a hardware store. He asked me why I hadn't called, and I told him it hadn't occurred to me. So, I'm almost out of tape. Guess I'll... I'll just let it run out while I eat. Let's go back. Yeah, let's go back. Everything's down here now. Is uh, going back an option from here? Uh, we can't go back anymore. We can only go back to the last decision. Well, in that case, I think we better skip to the big part. Yeah, I won't tell a soul if we skip to it. In the distance, Donald. Think of our work, our research. Joseph in the distance. You'll die in these damn cold caves. And what about those men? You know they'll come back. We'll go deeper. That's all. They'll never find us. Did you hear their voices? They're not... They'll find you. But not me. I'm going back to the surface. Stop. Your stupid fight is ringing through the whole damned cave. Joseph is right. We can't stay here. I'm leaving too. But I'm not going back to the surface. I'm taking my station wagon and I'm heading down the zero. You'll be lost forever. But we need your voice for the machine, Lula. It only recognizes your voice. I'll send you this tape when I'm done recording. I'll put it in the mail. And then you can see what your damn machine does with it. Oh. That was deeply sad. I don't know what else to say about it. It just leaves me with, with this odd sense of sadness. Basement Puzzle Number Two Artist, Sunset, and Horse, 1976. Plaster and Wire. What do you think she means by puzzle? Yeah, weird. I guess it's something you can solve? They must be symbols. Artist, sunset, horse. Or it's an anagram? Or like, a code? Maybe it's not a puzzle, but it's just about a puzzle. Maybe it's a puzzle, but there's no right answer. It's kind of sad. That's all of them. Yeah, I guess I'm ready to go. Yeah, I need to get back to work anyway. God, that was such a cool interlude. If I did play that before and just forgot that I did, then, well, I'm glad I played it again. <laughs> 